annihilation. This was Lebensraum, the final fight against the communists, June 22nd, 1941, the longest day of the year. They chose that also because the roads would be dry. The Russian roads were basically dirt. Unlike France, who had nice paved roads, Russia did not have the infrastructure. And even though Germany is going to attack with the strongest army they ever had, still, they don't have enough troops. They don't have enough supplies. They don't have enough horses. And over 90% of their transport is still horses. They assume they'll capture Russian um, train engines, railroads, they, but Russian rail gauge is actually narrower, so they can't use German engines. I mean, this is an all or nothing attack. Germany is literally going to go all out thinking that the Soviet Union and Stalin will collapse in six weeks. And if that doesn't happen, happen, it's over. A terrible mistake, just because there's no way they have the resources to do it. But they attacked anyways and took the Russians completely by surprise. Stalin refused to listen to anybody who told him that the Germans were going to attack. A lot of the Russian spies who told him that would be uh, sent to the camps or executed immediately. Stalin didn't want to make any mistake. Should not have happened. But I drew this map up for you this uh, at lunch because I knew you guys would like a map. Is this pretty good? It has arrows. Yeah, I sleep all the night because of that. Here's Prussia, that part of Poland they took. Hungary, Romania, who were German allies. And in reality, it was a three-pronged attack. But the two prongs we need to get were Moscow. If the Germans believed that they could take Moscow, politically Stalin could not survive losing its capital. Which, in reality, with the beauty of hindsight, that was his best chance. Another way was to get down to this area here called the Ukraine, or Ukraine. Now, our independent country, then part of Russia. Why resources? So much of German Nazi thinking was to get to be self-sufficient. Lebensraum would be all this living space with, with the incredible farms of the Ukraine, but also the mineral wealth and, of course, the big oil. Think about Russia today, they still get the oil for the same area right here. Get this oil. So even though Russia was trading oil with them because of the Hitler-Stalin pact, Hitler wanted it for himself. Didn't want to be dependent upon the communists or various other racial elements he wanted to add into this. And following behind, I've mentioned this before. Remember I mentioned those, that those groups of SS called the Einsatzgruppen? I said that on Friday. Does that sound familiar to you guys? Einsatzgruppen followed behind. These are SS. They followed behind the German army and say, hey, got rid of the Zeppelins. But that would turn out to be, to the German point of view, inefficient and hard on morale for the soldiers to simply line up civilians and execute them. What are we coming to in 1942? The death camps. So, to give you an idea of what happened, we're talking hundreds of miles into the Soviet Union. But within two weeks, just you don't need to know the numbers, I'm just giving you an idea. Right here at Minsk, 400,000 Soviet soldiers were surrounded by German forces. 400,000. A huge victory right here. And outside observers thought, oh, Soviets are dead. They were advancing this way towards Leningrad, this way slower into the Ukraine. But something happened. Even at Smolensk, when they captured 300,000 men, by the middle of August, the timetable is slower than they thought. Russians are fighting much harder than they thought. Much harder. The Russian army was tough. They just made terrible mistakes. And the Russians had better tanks. A lot better tanks. They just weren't using them quite right yet. I mean, this is not going the way they thought. But the other thing is this. Supply lines. They couldn't get supplies. They outran their supply lines. Yeah, the Germans. The Germans got a supply. Every mile they moved into Russia. By the time they got to Smolensk, this is just to give you an idea. Not what you need to know. I mean, just it was taking 
three gallons of gasoline to drive one gallon of gasoline to use at the front. That's how inefficient their supply line was. And so that means there is no room for anything but gas, petrol, and ammunition. Food, they had to try to get from the land, or a little bit they could bring up. But the Russians, when they pulled back, they did what scorched earth. They heard of scorched earth, what does that mean? Destroy everything. And, I don't know if you know this, but it tends to get cold in the winter. They had no winter gear, this is all or nothing. Win the war by winter, we die. I mean, this, looking back at it, it is such a desperate maneuver by them. Would you like a fatal mistake? Number five. The only chance was to rush and take Moscow, but instead, Hitler ordered his tanks south into the Ukraine. And when they turned south into the Ukraine, by turning south, yeah, they want a Kiev captured over 900,000 Russian soldiers. An unprecedented victory. One of the biggest victories in the history of warfare. Yet by the time, and Stalin foolishly did not let them escape, but by the time they're ready to attack Moscow at the end of September, it's too late. It's too late. That was their only chance. Have you noticed the U.S. is not even in the war yet? Hitler is basically already doomed to his nation. He was not even in. Josh gave you an idea how awful the fighting was going to be even after that. And it was just terrible how close it was. And so what we're coming up to is the Battle of Moscow. The last gasp to try to get Moscow. And at first they did really well capturing huge amounts of soldiers at Vyazma. But then it started to rain in those Russian roads. They have a, um, this rain, in, they have, they're infamous for their fall rains. And the rains turn those, turn the roads into, they, they compare to like um, quicksand. Where they, they literally just, horses go right in and die. Tanks would drive themselves right into the ground. They couldn't move. When it froze in October, they could move again. But I think you guess what's happening. Pretty soon it's 30, 40, 50 below zero. The Russian winter killed them. German horses were not bred for that kind of weather. They just died by the thousands. Now, small little Russian ponies could survive, but they had to capture them. And their engines just froze. The Battle of Moscow would basically be from November 42, or 41, I'm sorry, November 41 through February 42. German reconnaissance got to where they could see the Kremlin. It was a monument in Russia right there, furthest advance of the German forces in the house. And then the Soviets counterattacked. Now, this wasn't a decisive victory. They pushed them back to about right here. And the Germans still held all this land, so basically all this. But the Battle of Moscow is one of the twin turning points of World War II and of history because it finally showed the Germans can be. They had won victory after victory after victory. It seemed like they invented a new type of fighting, and now they can be beaten. If they can be beaten, they can be stopped. Maybe we can decisively defeat them. It would be the next year that the decisive defeat would come for battles out. Curse would be the destruction, stall. Curse would be the end of the German army. And yes, yeah, main forces of the U.S. Army haven't even the war yet. It's still amazing how much happened here. So, big deal. Part of the reason they could counterattack is because Stalin was able to take about 600,000 experienced soldiers from here to fight in Moscow. They were here because of fear of the Japanese who would join their German allies. Remember the Axis powers? But the Soviets fighting Tokyo in November told Stalin, it's okay, Japan's not going to join their allies. They're going to get their oil elsewhere. You need to what are we talking about? Yeah, and that's why Stalin could get those forces. So, 
We're not quite to fatal mistake number six, but we'll come back to it because we got to do Pearl Harbor with it. So write down Japan. So a little bit about Japan. While this is all going in Europe, and this literally is a war of civilization. And don't forget, by 1940 and 41, Roosevelt, even though he knew America wanted to stay out of the war, he, Roosevelt's already thinking Hitler's the biggest threat to civilization. This is not just a little war for empire. This is a war for civilization. Men Lease, remember that program? He's already doing that. The United States Congress has voted for that. But Japan in the Pacific, this goes back to the turn of the century. The Japanese are moving out from Japan. The U.S. is moving that direction. Remember, the U.S. got the Philippines. Japan got like Formosa, which is Taiwan today, Korea. So Japan. Japan had a democracy all through the 1920s. But remember, they did feel humiliated by World War I. Also, they thought they should have got more in the Russo-Japanese War. And so there's this edge of humiliation. And we'll get to why this was such, such a big deal in Japan in just a second. But then the Great Depression hit. And the Depression hit Germany, or hit Japan hard, just like Germany. And much like Germany wanted resources, Japan became desperate, especially their, um, for, for oil. And nothing more than the army. The army became convinced that we must conquer areas so we become self-sufficient. And they would justify partially because, look, Britain had been doing it, the United States had been doing it, why can't we do it? And so, 31, horrible year for the Depression in Japan, the army, on their own, without orders from the civilian government, they attacked Manchuria. Manchuria then was an independent country, kind of a little, was a little kingdom. China was in a horrible civil war that went on in 49. And so, Manchuria actually was not part of China. Technically, they're not Chinese. They would take them in 1950. But Manchuria, Japan took it for resources. The League of Nations said, get out. Japan, of course, ignored them. But the big thing is this. Once that happened, the army basically took over the government. Now, you'll see that the textbook mentions the military. It's the army. The Navy was always reluctant on this area. The army was more concerned, and the army took control. The premier of Japan, when they attacked Pearl Harbor, was a general, Hideki Otoja. So the army's going to take over. They still had all the trappings of the parliamentary system. They still had a parliament that they called the Diet. Their government today is based upon that. It's almost the same government. And they still had a cabinet, they still had civilian members of it, but the army dominated. In fact, if you disagreed, you were killed. Yeah, these kind of, Japan got kind of crazy. Didn't work very well for them. It's too expensive, they didn't get the resources they wanted. Didn't work. So that should have been their first, this is a time they should have said, maybe just conquering areas won't work. So instead they conquered more. In 1937, they attacked China. Now, think about attacking China. China was going through a civil war. There technically was a government in China, but in reality, it was a bunch of warlords. They were not industrialized. They could be beaten on the battlefield. In fact, in two years, Japan took almost all the major cities of China. All the harbor cities. The problem was China didn't quit. And China was way too big for the Japanese to try to take over and conquer. And one thing we have to add to this, it's called Nanjing, even though then in America it was named King, but huge town to the east of Shanghai, right here called Nanjing today. After a pretty fierce fight, the Chinese basically committed everything. That was the capital of China. They tried everything to hold it. Japan defeated them. And then what they did is, it's going to be called the Rape of Nanjing. 
the Japanese basically gave their soldiers three days to do anything they wanted in that city. And they killed tens of thousands of people. Stole, murdered, raped. There were these horrible shots of, of Japanese soldiers using civilians as uh, practice um, to practice cutting off heads with, with their swords. Or using babies for bayonet practice. What they did with some of the most outrageous atrocities in history to this day, it has tainted Japanese-Chinese relations. China won't, Japan won't fully admit it. Admit, and this, what Japan did to all of China is horrific. This is the most famous example. Now the United States and other countries were bad, but do you remember this called open door? Do you remember that term open door? Where basically every, all the great powers would sign these unequal treaties with China so we can all equally exploit China? That was a U.S. big complaint. What about open door? Finish this tomorrow with Attack Pearl Harbor. We, we're not going to attack Pearl Harbor. Who's been to Pearl Harbor? One? How long ago? Oh, so you're old enough to remember. Yeah, you're old enough to remember, remember some of it. I've never been there. Really? You want to go? Yeah, I'll go. Oh, the problem is there's so many places I want to go. So it's like. Oh, yeah. Yeah, even when we were like Korea, but, like it was they did not like they were not like when my mom spoke Chinese. Oh, you, when you were in Korea? Yeah, I went to South Korea. Oh, okay. Like four years ago. Poor Korea had been conquered by the Chinese and then conquered by the Japanese. Yeah, poor Koreans. Hmm? Just poor Koreans. And then half the countries. Yeah, and then religion. That's what my mom was talking about. Oh, from Malaysia? Yeah, so we, like, when I was little, we used to spend, like, a month there. Oh, wow. Yeah, so I used to do that a lot. What about that? Um, like, 2012. So it's been a little while. But it was, we'd stay there for a month. Where would you stay? Would you? Um, so we stayed on the peninsula, and then we go to, like, Saba, where my, like, grandparents live. Yeah, sure, I'm going So we went on both, like, peninsula, and then we went to the peninsula. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. That's really cool. Oh, yeah, we're in the streets. Yeah, I always forget because uh, it's got the. The tube, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's just kind of all the Oh, you have to go back? I know. My mom was going to go through my senior trip. Yeah. Did you break the door? No, I just went there. I'm supposed to say right stuff, but I was talking to someone on my road. Do you have a problem with that? Wait, right? Right. She said something like pig war or something. Pig war! No, there's nothing at all like right stuff. Hand these out. We're talking about the pig war, you bunch of. By the way, thank you, Jake. I used to have one of these, and I'm glad you gave me another one. You goatish, folly, fallen haggards. You and I, huh? You give me that look. <laughs> you roguish, reeling, ripe, pumpkin. Did he give you like old English, like insult? Shakespeare insult, yeah. Somewhere my dad had one of these, but yeah, they go away and I forget them. But thank you, Jake. You good people. You good people. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about this and then we're actually going to start the last class. So we're going to be talking about this. It's rated R, even though it would be like OMG today. Okay. So basically, yeah. And just jot it out. Okay. And it's really like oh, yeah. ratings, like it's 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 this for me? Yeah. Yeah, this is a the Mercury Seven astronaut is one of the greatest movies ever. And then we then we'll land on the moon. Red. And then I can just sign up. <laughs>
Can I technically sign this? Can I technically sign this? No. No. Even if you're an adult, if you're still in high school, you're you're still you still are. Um, I'm able to sign field Yeah. Let's get a job. Yeah. Okay. Just on the back, just sign it. Sounds like. Or they're just telling them that we're watching. <laughs> Actually, technically, I don't have to have this song. Or read it to language. Yes. Where'd you get that? Oh, is that Costa Rica? Yes. He was in Costa Rica? Yeah. Good for him. Costa Rica's cool. And I think I was going to call him a logger headed, hedge born loodster, but not anymore. I'm going to ask him about that. That's cool. It's really dangerous. All right. Good news for all of you. First thing is first. Yes, if you notice, they try to turn my. Desk into a pear tree first period. Oh I said I would leave it up first period or for the day and it's gone. I did not see that. Yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, you know, I like it. It is April. Literally, you know, kind of fit. Next. Okay, we're going to watch the right stuff. What if you're the wrong stuff? I got the right stuff over that starts. I'm not gonna hurt. Huh? Oh, yeah, it is about to be. Huh? Oh, yeah, it is about to be. Oh, yeah, it is about to be. Oh, yeah, and the thing about it is, it's rated R because uh, just words, basically words, and a couple other things about when they go through a few words. I'm not kidding. Today it would actually be PG-13 when it was made, and it is. But it's a fantastic movie, and they also have a, a little bit of you would not believe the physical process they go through, all the testing for these astronauts. In a very clever way, you know, it's, it's a great, it's a movie, but they go through it, and so they have a couple little bits of the testing, and that's, yeah. Um, Question. So, it's all right. <laughs> no, it's got to be parent. Parent or yes. Just for <laughs> so please get this in, but it, it is, it's one of my favorite all-time movies. And one of the reasons I like it is because it talks a little bit about testing, but it also goes through astronauts and the first movie shot. It's just really well done, great actors. And there's certain guys that are like, John Glenn, I really like. And so, so just a couple, so you do have to get that song. And just a couple little bit of notes, we're gonna watch a little bit about Sputnik and then start the movie. And the movie, Let's go, Let's go take a notes out just a few things. <laughs> Did everyone have a good spring break? Um, Wasn't it too long? Yeah. Too long? Yeah. And actually, a week is just long enough to get out of the swing of school. But not quite long enough, you know. It looks vaguely like a blue jersey. Actually, it looks like a. A white breasted magpie. They are the damnedest birds I've ever seen in my life. 
They try to take, they try to take my wife's fish bottle right off her plate. Like, she's sitting there hopped on the table. Never seen a bird like so. It's really all right. Think about it's like a blue jay and a magpie. So mean, <laughs> <laughs> All right, so today we're going to talk a little bit about a more things about the Cold War. We got the NASA, but a few more things about the 1950s we have to get. Because, you know, we saw, and we saw the great video, and I wanted to show that about spacemen and talk about the balloon. And anybody want to, did anybody do that over the break? Go up to 100,000 feet, jump off. I don't want to say don't want to leave that. I don't think I want to leave that. Yeah, I don't want to do that. 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 And so think about all the issues of the Cold War. We're going to watch something on Sputnik. But part of the reason the space, part of the reason the space race became such a big deal it's so important. You've got to think about all the things going on in the world in the 1950s and into the 1960s. I mean, there's just an array of things. In fact, that's, and that's one of the interesting things about NASA and when they actually created the National Aeronautics and Space Administration and they started working on getting a man into space and the spacewalk and then to the moon, the whole world was spiraling. Science. But it seemed like spiraling almost out of control. First, all these incredibly tensions and events, and then all of a sudden, Vietnam, civil rights movement, all this going on while we have the space race. Right? They're in that kind of like an alternative universe. So let's just go through a couple of things really quickly. First off, in 1950, who were we fighting? 50 to 53? In the Korean War. We had the Korean War going on in the early 1950s. Now it turned out to be a draw. Um, by the way, first semester, do you, did you remember the Manchurian Candidate? Yes. Yeah. Good movie. <laughs> <laughs> the good fighting scenes and lots of sweating, but it's still a great movie. <laughs> a really good movie. But, yeah, you missed it. Yeah, I would highly recommend the Nigerian can. It's such a good movie. So, 53. But that's not the only three. Only thing. Now, think of all these events going on. And so then we also have the Red Scare, McCarthyism in the United States, the fear of some kind of communist insurgency. That, yeah, you know, McCarthy would basically be discredited by 54, but that went on through the entire decade, this fear of this communist, this communist persuasion. That's part of the reason why, you know, Kennedy wanted to look tough on communists and said, so many advisors in Vietnam, and LBJ wanted to look tough, also, and prove we're credible, and so sent troops into Vietnam. All this stuff was going on, but think about other things going on, too. In 54, speaking of Vietnam, what was the French fortified city that fell? Oh, Dien Bien Phu. Dien Phu. Remember, Dien Bien Phu in 1954. So the French lost there, now we have a split in Vietnam, another theater of the Cold War. Also, 1956, as you can see from this map. That's not going to work. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> it's going to come up. Apologize. Apologize. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> we didn't fall. In 1956, the Soviets invaded and put down a, a at least a, a, not really democratic, but a socialist movement in Hungary. They said troops had invaded, the Soviet, invaded Hungary in 1956. The United States encouraged them to do it, but they, but the Soviet sent in troops and brutally put it down. And the big thing about that was, the U.S. made a big deal. We'll help any country behind, what do they call that line then? We'll help anybody who tries to break away from Soviet influence, but when it actually happened, we didn't. Now there's a logical reason why. Are we willing to risk World War III for Hungary? Yes. Now to the Hungarian point of view, sure. 
But are we going to risk Wyoming? Yeah. No, never. <laughs> yeah. Or think about like in, in 1938, where it's like, we're not going to risk everything for this today. So we had a similar thing. But the point about Hungary is this. We felt weak. It gave the feeling in the United States that we were weak, that the Soviets were winning the Cold War. You know, China is now communist. Okay, the Korean War was technically a draw, even though you could argue it was a victory because the South Korea remained independent, but it didn't feel like a victory. The French were kicked out of Indochina, Indochina felt like a communist victory. Now Hungary felt like this victory. Excuse me, a series of humiliations, at least it appeared like it. And then in 57, what did the Soviets launch? Sputnik. So 57, we have Sputnik. We'll come back to this one, watch this quick video clip on that. I just like showing this one with Sputnik. Now, the thing about Sputnik, once again, now we're vulnerable. Sputnik's next. What else happened? Hmm? The dog. Well, actually, we didn't mention that. Back in 49, they already exploded a bomb. And both of them have the super and the hydrogen bomb. Yeah. Soon the monkey's coming, and we'll talk. We'll see that in person. Hmm? We will actually see in the movie we show the American. The Russians actually sent a dog. Vodka? Yeah. And the dogs. <laughs> 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 no, they did not bring the dogs. <laughs> yes. Vodka or vodka? Vodka, yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right, so, well, it's Russian. Russian, Russian dogs go by different names. They only speak Russian. Okay, Sputnik. Now, Actually, is here. I think they'll tell you. In fact, my dad was just talking about this again last week when he's sitting, sitting in a library. I always thought it was in Stuttgart, but I guess it was Karlsruhe. I know that changes the story. He was in the army and stationed in Germany, and Sputnik was just launched in the library and walked up to him and said, Look what the Soviets did. You're next. Well, <laughs> it is very, you know, he's German, but. A little bit of resentment still, <laughs> that whole World War II thing. And nobody likes occupied <coughs> armies. I just, New York. Yeah, they kind of went up. Speaking of that, it's another one that people don't really talk about that much, but it was a really big deal in leading to, in leading to the Cold War, Lebanon. Lebanon, the French, when the French left the colony of Lebanon, they left a Christian government, but the Christians were in the minority. And there's an attempted way to do a more democratic state where it would not be based upon just Christians in charge, because the majority population was Sunni Muslims. And the U.S. assumed this was some kind of communist incursion, and we sent troops. The Marines went into Lebanon, and the U.S. said, we're going to defend Middle Eastern countries against communist rule. It's called the Eisenhower Doctrine. And yes, the beginnings of fun in the Mideast. It would be in the next year that we'd help overthrow a government in Iraq. And the fun of this never ends. To this day there. Yes, we'll soon be supporting Saddam Hussein, but that's another story. But in Lebanon, now this is one of those things, okay, what you think about Lebanon, that's the Mideast. They just launched fun. They just put a dog in the space. They're about ready to put a human in this space. Who's worried that you can do that need an ICBM? And Lebanon see here's another thing. We must fight back. We must win somewhere. And then what happened? 5960. <clears throat> the Batista government, as we fled in the middle of the night, Batista, you even know what country that was in? Who was the revolutionary? Just passed away. Fidel Castro, his brother Raul. Raul Castro. Raul. Is there another Raul? 
Whatever that name came from. Okay, so Cuba, 90 miles from our shore. And so you get all these events happening. I mean, it's just like a cavalcade of events. What else? In 61, what was the invasion attempt by Cuban exiles in Cuba? Bay of Pigs. Failed miser miserably, or mystery. 62. Oh no, 61, we're not done. What was built in Europe? Not necessarily all of Europe, but one part of Europe. The Berlin Wall. Now this was basically to keep East Germans and Eastern Europeans from running away from the Iron Curtain, but it looked like the Soviets were going to isolate West Berlin for the chance to invade. They look at it, all these events are happening, and so this made it seem like the Cold War was spiraling out of control. And then in '62, that little crisis. And so when we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, where the country was nearly engulfed in the Civil War, and I don't know what. Driving with my dad in Maryland a few days ago, he was talking about just remembering the Cuban Missile Crisis and the fun of the Cuban Missile Crisis. Of course, I, you know, I didn't want to know anything about it because it really seemed like it was all over. Yeah, I guess I could see that. It was that scary. The Cuban Missile Crisis. Now, the world didn't go to war, the tensions didn't get alleviated, but that's why. In 63, when JFK was assassinated, that's why so many people believe there must have been some kind of communist assault. In fact, there was a, a fear, I mean, almost like an overriding fear that they might find out that somehow the Soviet Union was involved and the American people want some kind of retaliatory strike. I mean, look at all these things happening. Now, I'm not even covering it all, but with the Cold War, and then lastly, the Tonkin Gulf crisis. Remember that Vietnam, which would lead directly to American forces. So I put all these up to give you an idea how we have all these increasing tensions. So it came like we must get ahead. Yeah. Oh, so let's go and quick watch a little thing from this great series called the Fifties. It's actually the last one called the Sixties, but it's uh, it's fun, and I just like how they cover it and kind of set the stage then for the right stuff. <laughs> What? The 50s? It is? It is. Unless you call it. I know there's the 60s. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. If it is, I want to know. I didn't. The 60s and 70s is good. So let's go ahead and watch. Ow. My advice.